Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala khatim al-anbiya'i wa mursaleen. Sayyidana Muhammad wa alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Wa ba'd. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful, I begin with the greeting words of the righteous. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. It is again a great privilege for me uh, to be with you tonight. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would take these few moments and make them uh, as part of our hasanat on the day of judgment and that Allah would forgive us for our shortcomings. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, uh, friends, guests, we are living in very crucial times. And many of the decisions that we are making today will have profound influence upon our families and the world that we are living in. And Muslims in particular need to have basira, need to have the ability to look at events not only on the surface but to begin to look through the surface inside of what is actually happening. And the best way that we can do that is to constantly return to our sources, to Al-Wahi, to the revelation, to what has been revealed by the creator of the heavens and the earth, and to what was given to the last prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The political systems of the world have failed us. Socialism has failed. The capitalism is failing tribalism, nationalism, all the different isms and schisms that have plagued the Muslim world and the oppressed people throughout the planet have failed in bringing about unity and love and cooperation and the type of a world that we could live in as human beings, live a good existence with our fellow human beings and pass through this world. The Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, with over 100,000 followers in his last sermon, his Arafat sermon, laid down important principles. He made it clear to the believers that there is nothing worthy of worship but Allah, but the creator of the heavens and the earth, that he is the last messenger, and that all of their business dealings, all of their economic dealings done in ignorance should be abolished that they should not involve themselves in oppression in any way. That there is no preference for, for Arabs over non-Arabs, or non-Arabs over Arabs. There is no preference, no higher place for white over black, or black over white. But that taqwa, piety and right action, this is the only uh, thing that, should, that separates people. The Prophet, peace be upon him, also told us that men have rights over women, but women also have rights over men. And that the evil one has despaired of being followed in the Arabian Peninsula. Beware of him in other lands. That he would attack you in small affairs. And he told us very clearly, I have left you two things. If you follow these two things, you will never go astray. And that is the book of Allah and his sunnah. And so we seek refuge in the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who has given us the bottom line, who has given us the ultimate communication between creator and created. And Allah has told us very clearly in his book, A'udhu billahi min shaytani rajim, Ya ayyuha ladheena amunu taqullaha wa kunu ma'a sadiqeen. O oh, you who believe, have the consciousness of Allah and be with the truthful. And our scholars have shown us that a sidq is not only truth in words, but the heart should confirm what we say. And the limbs should practice that which we believed in and that which we confirmed in our heart and that which we said. 
we should practice what we preach. And so the truthful ones are not only those who claim to be on the right path, but those who are actually doing the work of those who are on the right path. Those who have humbled themselves to the Creator, who are not arrogant to other people, who are not filled with racism and classism and tribalism, and who are ready to submit to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah has also blessed us with the last messenger, peace and blessings be upon him, who did not speak from himself. But he spoke from revelation. And what he gave us in his authentic hadith is a direct message from Allah through a human being to us that we could also benefit from this. And when he spoke to the Sahaba, he not only spoke to them concerning their affairs, but he spoke to them concerning times that would come in the future. And in one hadith which is reported by Imam al-Suyuti and al-Jami al, al sagir Abu Huraira radiallahu an reports that the Prophet peace and blessings be upon him said, Yakunu fi akhir zaman dajjalun kathabun ya'tunakum min al-ahadith bima lam tasma'u antum wa la aba'ukum fa iyyakum wa iyyahum la yudillunakum wa la yuftinunakum the prophet peace be upon him said there would come in the end of time great liars kadhabun dajjalun to the point where they are false christs claiming to be false prophets would lead you astray and they will come to you with a type of speech that you nor your parents have ever heard of before beware of them beware that they take you astray beware that they put you into a fitna a trial and a, tempta and a temptation and so the prophet peace and blessings be upon him did not speak from himself and we are witnessing today with the advent of the new technology that human beings have the ability to send information throughout the planet simultaneously we have the ability to witness events here in Australia that could be happening in other parts of the world in Europe we could witness these events but at the same time we can be confused simultaneously the whole world can be lied to at once and they have the ability to twist around to to develop to put together images and sounds and to develop this story which although it is not true appears to be true and, and, and you know it's not true but you watch it as though it is true and it affects the way you think and so as the Prophet peace be upon him said Sadaqa Rasulullah alayhi salatu wasalam they will come to you with a type of speech that you nor your parents have ever heard of before you have never heard this thing before Sadaqa Rasulullah alayhi salatu wasalam as a young American growing up in North America mainly of african-american heritage i began to look for my roots to look into my family to try to connect this with what i was seeing on the television and what i was being given in the educational system and one of my grandparents was a native as you would call the aboriginals you would say it here in australia one of my grandparents was an aboriginal person in north america and they told us that the Indians, and that's the first lie, because Columbus was lost, and he bumped into America, and he called it in India. He thought he was an Indian. So we called the people Indians. But they told us and showed us in films that the Indians were a savage people. And they were always attacking the wagon trains. They were always killing their enemies, and they were even scalping their enemies. And you'll be surprised to know that the first scalping was done by extremists amongst the European settlers. They were the first to scalp. And as a reaction to this, 
the native people began to take their scalps. But it comes to you in a totally different way. They also told us that Columbus discovered America. That he discovered these lands as though there is nobody living here. But when you read the writings of Ferdinand Columbus, his son, and he was the one who, who stepped on the mainland. Columbus never stepped on the mainland. He only touched the islands. But when Ferdinand wrote about Mexico, he said he found a massive city as large as anything in Europe with hanging gardens, with pyramids, with all the trappings of civilization. And when the conquistadores went south to Peru, they found in the Inca civilization, they found high intelligence and they found amongst the people of the south calendars that were similar to the ancient Egyptian calendars. They found astronomy, technology, all types of science and knowledge. When they went nor north into North America, they found highly organized people. Amongst the Cherokee Nation, there were cities of over 100,000 people with three-story buildings. We don't hear this. They also found the Iroquois Confederacy, and it was the agreement made between the Iroquois Nation that was the basis of the United States Constitution. They don't tell you that. They don't tell you what they found in the Americas. And after that, a genocide occurred. And so by saying they discovered America, they own America, they own these lands, they tried to justify the mass murder that took place in millions of the native peoples from South America to Central to North America were wiped out through the killing of, of their stock by giving them blankets filled with deadly diseases that they had no cures for. And so they died by the hundred thousands and even the millions. But we hear stories about the cowboys and the Indians. And it gives you a totally different picture. And they make it seem so true that you get confused and they go so far even to name their baseball teams after the people they have killed and put in reservations. And so they have a type of speech, a way to twist the truth and reality that we have never seen before in a civilization. To the African Americans, to our people, they told us that we are free. And after the so-called freedom, we couldn't find jobs. We couldn't find decent places to live. We could not find education. And so it reached the point up until now, when you see this beautiful image of America, the reality is totally different. And you will be surprised to know that one in every four African Americans will go to jail at one point in his life. 25% will enter the prison. You will be surprised to know that of 8 million people who are in jail, in prisons, incarceration internationally, that 2 million people are incarcerated inside of the United States alone. There are more people in jail than there are in universities and colleges. And you'll be shocked when you go inside these institutions and see people in some cases that had nothing to do with crimes inside of the institutions and inside there for life. And one of the secrets we found is that people in a maximum security prison were making clothing. They were making running shoes and, and, and jeans and they were only being paid about 50 cents an hour. And so you have thousands of people, many of them in jail for life, working for 50 cents an hour. So what you have is a modern slave state. Another form of slavery which is done in the name of freedom and justice. They will come to you with the type of speech that you nor your parents have never heard of before. And then we look at the Muslim world. And we see in the past 50 years, we see gen massive genocides taking place. 
We see Palestinians driven out of their land. We see people throughout Africa living under tyrants financed by industrialized nations. We see wholesale murder and genocide. And now with technology, you even see the bodies of the people in Kosovo, in Bosnia, in Kashmir. You see it with your own eyes. We witnessed this being slaughtered all over the planet. Thousands of people mercilessly being killed. And then September 11th, an event that took place that with the use of technology, with people's minds being connected together by the electronic technology, it becomes a worldwide event. And no doubt it was a horrendous event. But there are also horrendous events that took place in Rwanda and Cambodia and Vietnam and in other parts of the world. And so the September 11th took place. And we as Muslims watched this thing happen. And we said, no, don't let them blame this on us. They blamed Oklahoma City on us. Only by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, some information got out. And they realized it wasn't a Middle Eastern character. That it was one of their own right-wing Johnny Appleseeds. One of their own homeboys who carried it out. But this event took place. And we did not, I want to make it categorically clear, we did not enjoy this event. It is not an Islamic event. And you will be surprised to know that there is a masjid. There was a masjid in the trade uh, center, in, in, in the Twin Towers. Over 1,500 people used to make Salat al -Jumar. And we know that if 1,500 people made Juma, how many didn't make the Salat? You know our community. So that means there were thousands of Muslims inside of that building who also perished. And up until now, we have received no conclusive evidence, only circumstantial evidence, but nothing conclusive. And, and, and they tell us that these young Arabs carried this thing out. And then we saw in Saudi Arabia, some of the people actually came, their name was on the list, and they went to the embassy and said, I'm alive. I didn't do it, man. I'm right here. Okay? No. Then they say, no, they carried it out, and these so-called religious extremists, before they do it, they're drinking alcohol the night before, getting drunk, and then they're going to sacrifice themselves for Allah. He writes a letter which so conveniently is found, and then it says, uh -uh, Bismillah wa bismi nafsi wa ailati, in the name of Allah, in the name of myself, in the name of my family. This, nobody writes like this. This is a strange situation. And then the building is, it falls down and destroyed and incinerated, and they find the passport. <laughs> they find the passport, man. So we're saying, what is the reality of this situation? Why are we being blamed for this? Why is a confusion happened when people are, 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 are made guilty before they are even taken to court? And every human being is supposed to be innocent until proven guilty. And then the whole of the Muslim world suffers. People who have nothing to do with the Middle East, nothing to do with any of this are suffering behind this. But at the same time, we begin to see the climax of a major change in society. The climax of a new world order. And we begin to see a type of integration between information technology and trade. We begin to see the economy politics, culture, and ideology being transported simultaneously from nation to nation. And with this technology, with the ability to transport ideas, the very value systems of people, the way that they eat, what they enjoy to do, how they enjoy recreation, their racial concepts, 
their culture, their ideology being transported all around the world. A type of globalization. And with this boom in the information technology, and with this major event that takes place, now it comes to a culmination. And it starts to reach a high point. And so the innocent people, we look at this, and we say, what is going on? What is happening to the world that had so many different varying views, different nations, different ways of approaching things that can complement each other? Now we see politics is stripped of real power, that the economy governs all social exchange. We see that the states serve the financial powers, power structures that the real power is no longer in the hands of the generals, but the real power now switching to the hands of the people who run the economy, to the banking systems. And then we see that politicians play the role of public relations offices only to control the masses, either by lulling them to sleep or by terrorizing them. And then we see that the masses of the people become helplessly preoccupied. Their lives are now bombarded with a series of cultural events. And these cultural events start to become the most important things in their lives. The World Cup, the Major League Series, the rugby, the cricket, the hockey, the tennis, whatever the sport may be. We see whole nations coming behind sports and the national heroes become sporting people. Even in Saudi Arabia, even in our own Muslim countries, the national heroes are now the soccer players. Who kicks the little ball inside of a net? He becomes the hero of the nation when people are dying on the ground. But yet we become preoccupied with this. And it becomes a type of indoctrination happening to us. And with the use of powerful music playing on our emotions, with videos now being taken to the furthest extremes in the planet, people's thinking processes are changing. People are now in love with the superheroes, even confused about their own identity, trying to change themselves, change the color of their hair, change their eyes change the way they dress, change the way they talk on a global level. And then we see drug addiction reaching a point that humanity has never seen before. And after traveling to over 36 countries, looking at the Muslims and being with them, I have found that in all of the communities that the young people are, are being confused with drugs. It is pouring into our countries. No matter what form it takes, cocaine, LSD, psychedelic, depressants, put you up, put you down, confuse you, but create a false world and give you a false dependence so that you become dependent on the chemical. You forget about Allah. Your God becomes the pusher. Your God becomes the chemical. And so creating this dependency amongst the masses of the people. And then we see lethal social diseases being spread. And it is said that in Southern Africa, and Allah knows best what this really is, but they say that in some parts of Southern Africa, one out of every four people is HIV positive. It has reached this level. Now, whatever this HIV is, there's a lot of theories whether it is some germ warfare, whether it is something passed through homosexuality, whether it is a type of corruption. What some doctors have even said is that your immune system can break down by a number of factors. Not only a virus that they had never really located and shown us what it looks like, but the immune system can break down from malnutrition, from tuberculosis, from forms of malaria, and they've listed almost 40 ways that your immune system can break down. And if you take a test, you will be considered HIV positive. But whatever it is, it's killing us. 
It's killing us in large numbers. Then we see the planet malfunctioning. We're supposed to be rising in technology. Our life is supposed to be getting better. But the very planet that is created in order to serve us is malfunctioning. The air is becoming polluted. The water is becoming polluted. The animals are dying. They are cutting down the rainforests. They are destroying forms of life. And now we are getting strange forms of cancer. Other diseases, other lumps and, and tumors and things popping up in our bodies that we have never seen before. And it's happening all over the planet. And so what is happening in front of us? When people begin to speak out, when they try to protest what is going on, even in a legal way they are protesting, they find themselves either swamped with false information coming out of the technology, or they find themselves terrorized. They find themselves in a state of fear. And so when the events happen as September 11th, the world changes. Those who are connected to the electronic technology are put into a state of fear. And images are being placed in front of their eyes as the images were before. And these images are connected to the geopolitical situation. Don't be fooled. Why do you think back in the, in, in the 60s we still had um, the remnants of the bad guys coming from World War II? Japanese, Germans, Russians. Why do you think that coming into the 80s and 90s, Spanish drug cartels, Afro-American gangs, and the most sinister character you can bring to the screen, the Arab terrorist. He seizes his hostages, and he will not release them until you release his comrades from the jail. This is before September 11th. Before that day, Chuck Norris was chasing us. Arnold Schwarzenegger, Steven Seagal, all of the so-called folk heroes are chasing around this image. We were being prepared for something. Our minds were being prepared for something. This does not happen by chance. And we, the innocent people, trying to look at the world and trying to understand what is going on, we see everything is moving toward one world state. One world police force, one world bank, and one world unelected elite that rules over us not based upon the will of the people or democracy, but rules over because of control of the bank, control of the economy and the flow of the money, which is changing every day, changing from gold and silver to paper to plastic, and now they are trying out chips. They're putting chips in somebody's head. They tried it in Florida. And if you can take anything from me, don't ever let anybody put a chip inside of you. Don't let them do it to you, man. A microchip. And they say, no, it can do you a lot of good. If, you have, if you're diabetic, it will say you're diabetic. And then they showed us this picture, they show us this movie or, or, or this commercial how this chip can play itself out and there's an old woman inside of the store and she's shopping in the store and the young guy is next to her stealing things he's putting it in her clothes in, in his clothes and she says oh my god he's stealing and he fills his clothes with food and items and he runs out the store and, and the old woman is in shock and then the attendant the clerk runs behind the man and says you forgot your receipt <laughs> you forgot your receipt he had a chip inside of him. And when he went through that barrier, it recorded his bank account, the money that, 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 was, that, that he took out the store, everything simultaneously uh, happened. And then she said, you forgot your receipt. What a beautiful world it would be. What a beautiful world. But the problem we're facing is, what else can happen with that chip? What else can be done to the chip? Your emotions could be controlled. Your mind could be controlled. You could even be killed. Well, Iyadu Billah. 
In the earlier decades, people wrote about this. George Orwell wrote about it. You saw in 1984, you saw people talking about animal farms, talking about Big Brother. They wrote about this before. Now it is coming to pass. And there are so many theories about this. We are bombarded with this. We see people talking about the Freemason order, the Illuminati, the international bankers, the Zionists, alien consciousness. Even some groups are coming up, satanic type groups, new age type religions. All of these coming up and what we find in most cases is that all of these groups are worshipping a force. If you go to the highest level of these groups, you see they are doing a type of worship. It is not to God. It is not the God of Moses or Jesus or Muhammad. Peace be upon them. It is another force. And they are worshipping this force. They are seeking and taking strength out of this force. And nobody can say exactly what it is. But Muslims have the bottom line. And Allah has told us, قُلْ جَاءَ الْحَقُ وَزَاهَقَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ كَانَ زَهُوقًا The truth has come. And falsehood will vanish. Because surely falsehood is a perishing, vanishing thing. And so the Quran and the, and the Hadith, the revelation gives the Muslim the bottom line. And we need to work from the bottom line up. Instead of from the confusion to the bottom line. And when we go to the bottom line, we find that the Quran talks about in the beginning of time, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had created the creations, and then he created Adam alayhi salam. And he turned to his angels, and amongst the angels was a jinni named Iblis. May Allah protect us from him. There was a jinni amongst them who was so pious and so knowledgeable, he was given a place with the angels. The angels could not disobey Allah. And so Allah told them in the, in the oft-repeated verses, Ushjudu li Adam fasajadu illa Iblis. He told them, bow down to Adam. And all of them bow down is except Iblis. And Surah Al-Kahf told us, Kana min al-jinn. He was jinni. He was not a fallen angel. He refused to bow down. Why did he not bow down? You made me from fire and you made him from clay. Arrogance and pride. And you could say he was a racist. He was the first racist because he didn't want to accept Adam. Not because of anything that he or Adam did, but because merely of the creation of Adam alayhi salam. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cursed him and sent him down and promised him hellfire. But the shaitan will iyadu billah asked for respite. He asked for a chance to come to the creation. And he made it clear and the Quran tells us very clearly that he said, I will come around them on their right side, on their left side, above them. I will make them change the creation of Allah. And in one of the verses, and there are so many, so much truth which is in front of us, if we would read this book, not just to read, read it for the knowledge, read it for the guidance in the world that we are living in today. And it tells us in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah tells us, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الناس كلوا مما في الأرض حلالا طيبا ولا تتبعوا خطوات الشيطان إنه لكم عدو مبين إنما يأمركم بالسوء والفحشاء وأن تقولوا على الله ما لا تعلمون and so Allah told us, O oh people, eat from the earth that which is permissible and wholesome, that which is good, and do not follow the footsteps of the shaitan. For he is to you an open enemy. Verily, he will command you with immorality and evil, sexual immorality, and he will also command you to say about Allah that which you know not. In another verse, Allah tells us, Ashaytan ya'idukum al faqa wa ya'murukum bil fahsha. That He will threaten you with poverty and He commands you 
with immorality, with corruption. He commands you with this. And so we see certain themes. Put these themes in your mind when you think about the international system. What are the foundations of the system that we are all living under? The fear of poverty, evil, corruption. And then we see also in Surah Al-Ma'idah, Allah tells us, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِنَّمَا الْخَمْرُ وَالْمَيْسِرُ وَالْأَنْصَابُ وَالْأَزْلَامِ رِجْسٌ مِنْ عَمَلِ الشَّيْطَانِ فَاجْتَنِبُوهُ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ الشَّيْطَانُ أَنْ يُوقِئَ بَيْنَكُمْ الْعَدَاوَةَ وَالْبَغْضَاءَ فِي الْخَمْرِ وَالْمَيْسِرِ وَيَصُدُّكُمْ مِنْ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَعَنِ الصَّلَاةِ فَهَلْ أَنْتُمْ مُنْتَهُونَ Allah tells us, O you who believe, surely intoxicants and gambling and sacrificing at the idols and telling the fortune with arrows, all of this is an evil abomination from the work of the devil. Stay away from it in order that you would be successful. Surely the shaitan wants to put in between you hatred and animosity by using intoxicants and gambling and to block you from the remembrance of Allah and from your salat, from your prayers. So will you not then stop? Allah tells us, won't you stop? But what did the evil one put in front of us? Look at the categories that are in front of us. Evil. Go to the movie and see. The hero of half the, of the movies is a criminal. The thieves and the bandits are now the heroes that people, young people especially, are idolizing. Look at the music. Look at the expression coming out of the anarchy and the music in the younger generation. Then look at now the world. Immorality. And then you see it in the movies, you see it in the programs. And some of our own Muslims are watching, especially sisters are watching during the day, they watch Days of Our Lives and soap operas and you know, who's sleeping with whose neighbor and stuff like that. And, and then they even tape the program. Yeah? They tape the program so they can see it when they come home. This practice in Muslims, man. It's unbelievable, man. And so then you see it happening. Drugs, al-khamar. Because intoxicants includes not only alcohol, it also includes drugs. The cocaine, the heroin, the crack, the LSD. Ma yukhamal al-aqal, that which covers up your intelligence. All of this is in it, right inside of our book. So now let us look at a modern society. What happens on Friday night? When a person wants to enjoy themselves, where do they enjoy themselves? Where do they think they have to go to? The majority of the people say, well, first, my Friday, I got to get a drink. Let me get a drink first, okay? Let me take a smoke. I got to get ready now for the night. And then they're off for the night. How do you enjoy yourself? What are the places being built right here in Melbourne? Right? The Crown Casino. Where are people going to? Even here in Australia, down under. You have what? The second largest casino in the world. And you're down under. <laughs> what about the people who are up on the other side? <laughs> casino life. Gambling. And the gambling will destroy you. You see what it says here? Rijsun min amilis shaitan. It is a filth. It is an abomination from the work of the devil. Stay away from it. But no, the roulette wheel. They play all the, the one-armed bandit, the dice, the cards, and they keep thinking, I'm going to win, I'll go back tomorrow, I'm going to win, I'm going to win, and the shaitan plays on their mind and destroys their families, destroys the society. But it's considered to be, okay, he's just enjoying himself, or he's just drunk. But what causes most of the accidents on the highway? Go to the, go to the transport authority right here in Australia and see over the Christmas vacation and the main holidays what causes most accidents on the highway and you'll probably find it is alcohol. It is people being intoxicated, toxic. You're being poisoned. It poisons the system. 
throws off your balance, changes your way of thinking. And so we find in this new world order that we become intoxicated. We are involved in gambling. No, I won't go to casino. I will go to the discotheque. I will go to rave, and I will rave all night. And we have a thing in Cape Town, I don't know whether you have it, they call it ecstasy. And they gave it to the young generation, ecstasy. They use all these names, right? Ecstasy, like you're really, you know, in some type of heaven. And they, 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 they give it to the younger generation, and he stays up all night, and he's raving around. And to catch the Muslims in Cape Town, they even made the rave center look like a masjid. On the side, it looks like Masjid al-Aqsa. On the front, it looks like the Blue Mosque in Turkey. And they had seven levels of rave. And even for the Muslims in Cape Town, and this is an advanced form of corruption, they said, no, um, when you're dancing, if you want to eat, they have halal food. <laughs> so you can have halal food. And you can still be a Muslim, you see? That's how it was tailor-made for us. And so, a rousing passion. A rousing this. Why do you think in these movies there's this terrible violence they are showing? And then always they, this erotica, this Greek concept now coming in where the body, people worship the body. The shape of the body being the most important thing. And the young woman feels she must show something from her body in order to be acceptable. She must expose her body even to her enemies. She exposes her body and thinks that she's modern or thinks that she's intelligent and she has self-esteem because she's exposing her inner parts even to her enemies. And up until now, with years of so-called women's liberation, they are still selling cars with beautiful girls. Lamborghini, the Porsche, they're still doing that, exploiting the sexuality of women in order to sell products. And so we see it happening, we see it, and in the second, and in the last part of this verse, or, or, the, or in the last part of the categories, the Chama and the Maser also shirk the polytheism, worshipping other gods, and fortune-telling. And people are involved in superstition and in fortune-telling, getting their palms read, going to people, to, 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 the, to the magic people, in order to get married, or in order to hurt somebody, or in order to be successful in business, afraid of numbers, afraid of 11, afraid of 13, afraid of 666. And so fear is placed in the hearts. Superstition is placed in the hearts. And behind it, a lying deceiver. You think you're going to paradise. You think you're enjoying yourself. But the alcohol and intoxicants is killing your body. Lethal social diseases is cutting down your population. Gambling is ruining the family, ruining communities. But it's done in the name of progress and democracy and the 21st century. And the Quran also tells us that shaitan will say when the matter is decided. And this is a picture in Jahannam, in hell. When the people are down burning in hell and they see the shaitan burning in hell and they say, but you promised us. You promised us the promise of truth. And he said, I had no authority over you, but I called you and you came. I had no authority over you. And they really have no authority over us. But they call us, they put out the signals, they put out the advertisement, and we follow them. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also told to the shaitan and made it clear, well, Iyadu billah, inna ibadi laysa laka alayhim sultan that surely amongst my slaves, my worshippers, you will have no authority over them except those who follow you from the evil doers. Except those who submit to you and submit to this system. And so we find ourselves Muslims and non-Muslims. 
people of conscience, people of goodness, who knew this world 30 or 40, 50 years ago, who knew their generations, knew their grandparents, and see the social fabric of society falling apart, racism on the rise, murder being spread all throughout the planets, and then they are accusing Muslims. Why are they accusing us of this? Let's go to the bottom line. And what you have to realize, if behind all of these secret societies is the evil one, is the shaitan wa iyadu billah, then he will attack the holders of truth. That if you are talking and living the revelation, you become an enemy to the evil one, wa iyadu billah. And so the reality is that we must never forget that Muslims must never forget that Islam is the real solution for this planet. We hold the solution in our hands. We hold it in our hearts. And we need to practice this now. Never forget who you are. Nobody cares if you just wear a kufi on your head. Or if you just say that your name is Ahmed. The biggest gangsters in Cape Town have Muslim names. The biggest gangsters. So nobody cares what your name is. But you have to realize that we have an interest-free economy. That if Allah blesses us with a state, we would establish a, a cooperative society which is not capitalism, it is not socialism. The banks will lend you money with no interest. It will be a cooperative system where if you have land and the bank gives you money, if your project succeeds, you both succeed. If your project fails, you both fail. Now, if you borrow money, if you fail, the bank wins and you fail. How many people know the, the, the pressure of living under a mortgage or a bond? It follows you all your life. Some people pay the bond for 20 years, hard labor, and then when they can't pay, their house is taken away from them. Some of them never live to see the fruits of their labor. It is burnt up in papers. And so an interest-free cooperative society and if our sheikhdoms, if our rich leaders would take their money out of these interest banks and put it into an Islamic economy, we would change the face of this earth. That for many people is the bottom line. But don't forget also that within our understanding is the true belief in one God, the true Tawheed, with no confusion, no human beings as God, no idols as God. No confusion about your creator, but a way to communicate without a pope, without a bishop. Each individual can communicate, male or female, can communicate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We also have strong families. We emphasize strong families. Stay together. And Islam is telling us, and never forget, and try within your lifetime, that father and mother try to eat ch with your children. Establish your family so that the children are eating with their parents. Spend time, father, spend time with your children. Mother, spend time. Don't spend all your time chasing the dollar. Chasing something which will rise and fall in the twinkling of an eye. But we encourage the strong institution of the family. We also have a clear identity for male and female. And if we are practicing Islam, we should not be confused if we're a man or a woman. We shouldn't be confused. We also have a cure for racism. That you don't look at the color of a person's skin. You don't base that, that, the judgment of that person, not on their color, not on their language, not on the texture of their hair, but it is taqwa. It is the piety. It is the God consciousness. That is how you should judge an individual. We also have a holistic science that would take us into an era of science whereby 
the scientists would think of the Creator. That in using technology, we would not be destroying life, but enhancing life, developing the earth, and not just developing plastics, and trying to make more money with our science and technology. And we also have a khilafat, that we want to be ruled by the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that the leader would be the one who would institute these laws, not from any special family, but the one who deserves to be the ruler of the people. And so, with a system that is so clear and honest and straightforward, why are we under attack? That is the job of deception. And the deception has come in this new globalization form, this, this now, this, this spread of technology, it is now shifted to us, trying to make us into an evil force. But never forget that the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, he was called Majnoon, crazy. He was called Sahir, a magician. He was called a Kahin, a wizard. He was called Sha'ir, a poet. They used many names for him. They persecuted him. They tried to destroy his family. They tried to destroy the, his society. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has power over all things. Yuriduna li yutfi'u nur Allahi bi afwahihim. Wallahu mutimmu nuri. Wallahu kariha al kafirun. They want to put out the light of Allah with their mouths, with their information. But Allah will complete his light even though the disbelievers despise it. And we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would give us basira in these times. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would guide our leaders, would guide our communities, would protect our families. May Allah protect the women and the children of the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa May Allah give strength and protect the men of the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa May Allah give the true vision of Islam to those who are not Muslim. May Allah take away the veils from their eyes and see that, that Islam is the real solution to the problems of this world. May Allah complete his light. And we pray, if possible, may Allah let us see a little bit of this light in our, in our lifetimes. If we cannot, then we ask you, oh Allah, to let our children see it and let the Muslims see victory and begin to see the light. And may Allah give us the best. If we cannot see it in this world, Give us the best in the hereafter. Have mercy upon us and enter us into paradise. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa li sa'ari muslimin min kulli dham. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Are you tired of all these annoying ads on YouTube? Are you worried that a haram video might pop up? Well, the One Islam TV app is here to solve these problems, inshaAllah. The One Islam TV app is 100% free of any ads and is safe to browse for your peace of mind. Watch or listen to lectures and lessons while you work, rest or drive with your device switched off. Watch videos on demand or download videos and watch offline. Watch hundreds of high quality produced Islamic reminders, Quran learning videos, stories of the prophets and so much more. Two to four new videos uploaded daily, insha'Allah. One Islam TV is 100% run and owned by Muslims, which means a small amount you pay for your subscription is a sadaqa jariya, continuous charity for you as we use the funds raised to continue producing more beneficial videos and reminders, insha'Allah. The One Islam TV app is now available on Apple devices, Apple TV, Android devices, Android TV, Amazon Fire TV, and Roku. So you can watch on most devices and smart TVs. Download now for a free 7-day trial. May Allah reward you for supporting our work.